Hello. So uh, it is my great pleasure today to introduce uh, our, our speaker, Andrew Shea. Uh, Andrew uh, is uh, a newly minted professor and uh, associate head uh, and of the human biology Div division, right? Um, just got that over at the Hutch. Uh, and so Andrew got his start as a as an MD, he's a, a practicing oncologist uh, in um, specializing in, in genital urinary cancer, such as prostate and bladder cancer. So uh, Andrew got his uh, MD uh, at um, is Einstein School of Medicine. Uh, he then went over to UCSF and did his internship as well as his fellowship uh, and as well as a postdoc and then moved here in 2014 over to the Hutch uh, where he has risen through the ranks. Uh, as I said, he specializes in genital urinary cancers, uh, and he spent a lot of time uh, studying both bladder and prostate cancers. He's very well funded in that area, has published dozens and dozens of really nice papers uh, on the biology uh, of, of those cancers. Uh, and specifically kind of uh, is, is focusing on the area in the in the central dogma, right? There's uh, there's replication, there's transcriptions, translation, and he's kind of nestled between the transcription and the translation, and understanding how cancers uh, kind of exploit uh, that area in order to survive and, and to adapt. Uh, so today he's going to talk about mRNA translation in cancer etiology. So please look to hear, look forward to hearing. Well, thank you, Scott. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Um, and thanks for having me here. Uh, so yes, I'm a physician scientist. I actually don't normally dress like this, but today is my clinic day. So I literally walk from the surgical building to here. Um, normally I like dressing as you're dressing. Actually, a little less dressed up than you are actually with the uh, just the t-shirt on. Um, but it's a great pleasure of mine uh, to come and speak here about some of the work that we're doing in the lab. These are some of my disclosures. So over the years, um, we have, as a lab, focused on the process of mRNA translation in physiology and disease. And so like Scott said, oh, sure, absolutely. Hello, better? Clear? All right, I will continue. So over the years, we focused on the role of mRNA translation in physiology and disease. Uh, mRNA translation indeed does fit right into central dogma. It's DNA, RNA, and then proteins. And then that process of RNAs become proteins, that's mRNA translation, as we all know here. Um, and over the years, we've learned that it seems to be really important in specific aspects of normal physiology. Right here are two examples, like erythrocyte differentiation as well as cell-phase choice. We've also learned... Um, that's important in cancers, and we've shown that in prostate cancer, it, uh, the androgen receptor, which is highly deregulated in prostate cancer, um, can actually control the process of mRNA translation at the step of initiation, um, and that can actually be a druggable target. And we also found that in bladder cancer, that it seems to be important for efficient transformation. Furthermore, we've done work uh, um, doing functional genomics, studying patient-based 5' prime UTR mutations, how they influence gene expression, and more recently, some work uh, in tumor heterogeneity with single-cell RNA-seq. But if I had to kind of distill down what this entire talk is going to be about in one slide or what we do in one slide, it's really to understand the complex dance between RNAs and proteins and how translation occurs, okay? And if I had to distill that part down, I'd say that Translation in particular is the protein side um, of translation, like translation initiation factors, elongation factors, and it's interfaced with RNA, such as rRNAs or mRNAs. And when those two things clash, that enables the process of protein synthesis. And a perfect example of that is this complex right here called the EIF4F complex, which is basically the first complex that needs to form around a capped mRNA in order to recruit the ribosome 40S subunit, okay? And so today's talk is gonna be centered on these two aspects of mRNA translation, the mRNA side of translation, as well as the protein side of translation. 
And you'll see what I mean in a second. So first, the mRNA side. So credit where credit was due, this work was uh, largely done by Samantha Schuster, an intrepid uh, PhD candidate in my laboratory who has since gotten her PhD and is now doing a short postdoc in my lab. She's looking for jobs and in industries, as well as a computationalist in my lab, Sonali Aurora, who's been with us for about um, since 2015. And so when we typically think about the cancer genome, uh, and we think about things like TCGA, the cancer genome atlas, and where mutations happen. A lot of what we're focusing on is this little area right here uh, called the open reading frame or the, the, the coding sequence. Of course, I put this small on purpose because I want you guys to focus on what is flanking these areas on mRNAs, which are the untranslated regions, right? There's a five prime UTR, five prime untranslated region and a three prime untranslated region. And it turns out these areas are really important for gene regulation. Um, and in particular, we've published previously the five prime UTR is really important for the regulation of translation in cancer. And what Samantha wanted to study was the three prime UTR. But the three prime UTR is a little bit of a different problem. What it does is it regulates the process of mRNA translation and RNA degradation and does so through cis regulatory elements, which could be sequences or structures, as well as transacting factors, which are usually proteins. Sometimes it could be RNAs, like microRNAs, that could basically bind and then augment the function of that mRNA. It could destroy the mRNA. It can make it work better. It can make it translate more, translate less, okay? And if we look at some of the literature that's out there, it's been shown by different groups that the three prime UTR sequence itself is actually really important in titrating gene expression. This really nice work by uh, the Geronovich lab at WashU basically used a massively parallel reporter assay and random sequences put into a construct and found that if you use specific sequences enable better translation than others. Very simple concept. This big paper by the Sebade Laboratory uh, from the Broad basically showed that if you look at somatic variant, uh, variant not somatic, but variants amongst, page, uh, amongst people, this can associate with different changes or um, uh, expression levels of RNAs or even translation sort of in the way she did the study. But one big question that remained, and this is something that Samantha tackled in the laboratory, was what's the role of three prime UTR in human cancers? And so we decided to use cancer genomics as a lens into what are the important parts of the three prime UTR in human disease. And to do that, we turn to whole genome sequencing data as well as UTR sequencing. So we actually had whole genome sequencing data from the Stanford Cancer Dream Team. It's 101 patients where we can look very carefully at the three prime UTRs at pretty good depth. Um, and then for the UW samples, those were the rapid autopsy samples from patients who had died of their prostate cancer. And prostate cancer is the focus of this part of the talk. And what you'll notice after we did all the sequencing and all the QC um, with all the filters, you'll notice that there are a lot of somatic mutations within the three prime UTR. Now, I don't need to explain to you, you from M3D, you from the Department of Pathology, that that's not surprising. There are just tons of mutations littered throughout the genome, coding, non-coding, okay? So this is not surprising. The question is, are they functional? And if they are, how? And that's what she sought to untangle over her PhD uh, work in my lab. First thing we noticed is that while they do affect the same genes at times, these three prime UTR mutations can actually also impact genes that are very different from each other. In other words, there were about 5,000 genes in which coding sequences had mutations, but these were not found in five prime UTR or in three prime UTR. And likewise, there are three prime UTR genes uh, that were mutated that didn't have coding sequence or five prime UTR mutations. Now, this brings up an interesting idea in that you could potentially, the, some, uh, the level of somatic mutations in other portions of gene regulatory elements could potentially lead to a diversity of genes being affected uh, beyond what we know in terms of coding sequences. So it basically opens up the map in terms of what cancers can do and the genes they can influence. As more evidence that these genes are potentially important, she did a simple GSCA analysis. And you'll notice that a lot of these genes fall into 
cancer pathways, as well as significant uh, signaling pathways such as insulin signaling, as well as uh, HER2 signaling right here and wind signaling. She also looked at uh, the recurrence of some of these genes. We didn't, we only found two genes that were listed as hotspots or two areas that were listed as hotspots, but you'll notice there were certain genes that were mutated in more than one patient. Um, and what you'll notice is some of these were cancer associated, such as the, the vital transcription factor of FOXA1. Now, looking at this data set a little bit more, we wanted to know if there was some kind of regional specificity. Was it close to the poly A? Was it close to the stop site where we would find these mutations? And it turns out when you look across a quintessential three prime UTR, there was no difference from, you know, basically the three prime side uh, all the way to the poly A. However, when she looked at genes that had more than one mutation, she had this really interesting finding that a lot of these mutations were actually quite close to each other, less than five bases away, which brought us to the idea that maybe there was some functionality. Maybe there were certain regions that were being targeted. You know, I mean, that's kind of anthropomorphic, but that there were certain regions that were more appropriate for cancers to have mutations there. And in order to answer that question computationally, and this is still a correlation, but it's a pretty interesting study she did, was we basically permuted, we took those 14,000 mutations, their trinucleotide context, and we asked a very simple question. If we now just dumped them onto the three, entire three prime UTR and did that test 10,000 times, how often would that occur that mutation occur on a known RNA binding element or a, a microRNA site, okay? Because those are functional regions. And what you'll notice here is that observed is gold and expected is black. That's the computational, okay? So one's real, like what we actually counted, and the other one is what we would expect, you know, from this computational analysis that we did. And what you notice is looking at you know, RNA binding sites, as well as eClip data, as well as CISBP, that the mutations that we actually saw that actually landed on these sites were more than what was expected by chance. And so you might think, ah, oh, that's just, you know, it's computation, maybe, maybe everything looks like that. Well, we looked at microRNAs as well. That was true. But when we looked at specific motifs, it wasn't true. So there's an RNA modification that happens that can influence RNA metabolism called M6A, these were actually less than what we expect by chance, whereas uh, polyadenylation signal mutations were actually more than what we expected by chance. So all of this point to the idea, all of this computational data, again, all correlation points to the idea that maybe three prime UTR mutations can be important for influencing cancer etiology in some way, shape, or form. So how do we get to the bottom of this? 14,000 mutations, can we test all of them? That's what Samantha wanted to do we run into two simple issues. One is one, we know that the three prime UTR regulates the amount of translation that an, an MR could go, undergo. But we also know that the three prime UTR also regulates RNA degradation. So in order to get at this functionally, she created two parallelized, massively parallel reporter assays, which I'll walk through right now. So the first one's a translationally based massively parallel reporter assay. And basically what that is, is think of it as thousands of plasmids, each with this, a, either a wild type version of the three prime UTR or mutant version of the three prime UTR cloned into this as a pool. Okay. And it's driven basically uh, by a CMV promoter. Okay. Uh, it's downstream of luciferase. And what we did in order to measure translation is we went ahead and took this, introduced it into cells, transvected it. And then what we did was we put it onto a sucrose gradient where we could separate out mRNA based on how many ribosomes were attached to them. And so this is usually what that looks like. This is a polysome gradient. And so the monosome is just one ribosome and these little bumps here, that's two ribosomes, three ribosomes, four ribosomes, and so on. And so by taking those, this fraction right here, and sequencing it and comparing it to total mRNA, we can actually measure translation efficiency for each one of these pairs, okay? And so that's what she did to measure translation. What about RNA degradation? And frankly, yeah, at first I was like, well, we're looking at total RNA, but it turns out RNA degradation is actually quite different. 
Um, and we had data to show that. So we wanted to make an assay that was unique that could specifically look at mRNA translation. In order to do that, she engineered a T7 promoter such that she could in vitro transcribe the entire library, polyadenylate it as well as cap it, and then transvect that into cells and pull out the RNA at different time points and then measure their decay. So in doing these two assays, she was able to look at all of those, uh, quite a few of the mutations. I, I believe there were like 9,000 of them. And actually, no, about six or 7,000 that she looked at. And this is the fruit of her labor. I mean, this is basically like three years of work, all in one slide. Um, and what you'll notice is that there were hundreds of mutations that can either decrease translation or increase translation. And these do affect genes that are important in cancer, such as insulin-like growth factor 1R, among others. She also found hundreds of genes that can actually uh, decrease stability or increase stability. And that can also affect genes that are important in prostate cancer, such as ASCL1, which has been shown to be important for neuroendocrine differentiation or a very aggressive form of prostate cancer called neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Now, what you'll notice here is that there's quite a lot of color to this. There's a lot of blue on that side and a lot of purple on this side. And what these colors mean is that these mutations actually occur on predicted motif sites, right? The RNA binding protein sites or microRNA binding sites, right? So it suggests that a lot of the functional mutations actually reside on areas of potential functionality. And when we looked a little bit more closely, it was at RBPs, microRNAs. It's interesting that the winner for both translation and RNA stability was actually RBPs. A lot of the functional mutations we saw were actually centered around RBP sites and not microRNA sites, and they tend to have a high GU, uh, AU content. And in fact, we saw the same thing in terms of stability. A lot of these affected RNA binding sites and, again, an AU preference. Yes? I just had a quick question for clarification. Did you use the same luciferase reporter for both assays? We did. So we did use the reporter. The reporter essentially was kind of a... Uh, Exactly, exactly. So it was the exact same luciferase for both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So basically, we looked then at our group of functional genes and we asked, okay, what's so similar about them? Are there things that could predict for functionality? And we noticed that functional mutations were actually more likely to be in conserved regions, both at the translation level and at the stability level. We also noticed that when we looked at GC content as well as structural stability, what we noticed there was actually quite interesting. We noticed decreased GC content and less stability, suggesting that these RNAs were more were very likely open areas, right? And it kind of makes sense if the, it was a sequence-based recognition site. But we have evidence that that is true sometimes, but not true other times. And I'll go ahead and show you really soon because Massively parallel reporter assays are great. They're very powerful. There are a lot of people that do that here at UW and the Fred Hutch. But one of the issues that I find with massively parallel reporter assays, it's still a correlative readout, right? It's still saying, okay, this thing that I made is probably behaving the way it does in a cell. But that's a big jump that we're doing, right? So how do we actually get at ground truth here? And so in order to get to ground truth, what we did is we harnessed the power of base setting technology developed by David Liu's lab over at MIT. And what he's developed is these very cool ways of using ApoBec. We use the kind of the first generation stuff that can mutate. They use the cytidine deaminase and a dead Cas9 to target the cytidine deaminase to regions of DNA and then basically create point mutations there. And so what we can do for the first time ever is actually introduce these mutations that we see in patients that came up as hits and ask, do they do anything to the native endogenous proteins that we're looking at, right? So we decided to pick two of these in particular, one called Zwilch, which is kinetochore protein, another one called IGF-1R, which I already mentioned, growth factor receptor. And by using base adding technology, we were able to engineer on one allele within these cells, the exact C to T mutation that we saw in patients. One for Zwilch, as shown here. So this is wild typing. You see one allele has it. And the other one for IGF-1R, again, C to T. Uh, actually, this was a G to A. And so what you'll notice uh, at the end of the day was, okay, we created the mutation. Now the question is, both of these were up mutations in our 
mass repellent reporter assay. So we'd expect if we did a Western blot that we should see protein go up. And so that's kind of what she saw when she first showed me this Western blot. I was like, oh, I got to stare a little bit because you could see a slight increase in the protein levels. I was like, look, let's quantify this. So you didn't replicate multiple clones, great. And when she did it again and again, I was like, okay, maybe there is a slight increase in Zwilch levels and a slight in increase in IGF-1R without any changes in the transcript level, looking at Zwilch or at IGF-1R. So then I was like, okay, well, if it is up, does it do anything to the cell? And our, my bet was like, it's not going to do anything. And I was right on that bet. When we grew it in the incu site, there was no difference, right? Zero difference in growth between mutant and, and not mutant. But Samantha was unperturbed by my negativity. She was like, you know what? What if we grow it in stress? Because it's potentially in the context of stress, these small changes in Zwilch or IGF-1R might actually enable better growth. And so that's exactly what she did. But she did it very logically. So got Zwilch is important for kinetochore, right? Uh, DNA replication. And she was like, what if I damage the DNA using cisplatin, a common chemotherapy used in prostate cancer patients? And what she found was that when she used uh, cisplatin, the cells actually with the mutation actually grew better. So they had a little bit more Zwilch. And as a result of adding cisplatin, you could see that the ones with the Zwilch mutation actually did better. In the context of IGF-1R, that's different. It's a growth factor. So basically what we had to do was pull away growth factors using charcoal strip media or very low amounts of FBS. And when she did that, she saw a profound increase actually in the growth potential of these cells under stress. So when we saw this, I was like, okay, small changes matter. I mean, we're oftentimes looking for big changes, but small change can matter in specific context. And that's one take home for that. Now, the big question is, what is the molecular mechanism of this control of Zwilch and IGF-1R? To figure that out, she was like, okay, Zwilch mutation was in a very AU-rich region that looks like that. And this is a cartoon, so that's not exactly how these proteins bind to the AU-rich region, but this is cartoon. It's basically stylized to show you that there are many things that could bind there. And when she knocked each one down, she could find no difference in the amount of Zwilch that was actually made within the cell. But then she did the Hail Mary experiment and actually knocked down all of them all at once. And when she did that, she noticed that she was able to see that slight increase that you see when you actually had the activating mutation. And what's interesting is if you take the activating mutation cells and knock down all those targets, nothing happens. Suggesting actually that one of the mechanisms that seems to be regulating this process of slightly increasing Zwilch is a perturbation in the interactions of be between these transacting factors and that particular cis regulatory element within that three prime UTR. Now, as I said, there's a lot of color within those waterfall plots I showed you. But if you'll notice, some of those waterfall plots were completely gray, right? Some of those bars were gray. Those are gray because there was no sequence element that was known there. So what we deposited for those is that maybe there was structure within those three prime UTRs. So she did a very simple experiment, took the three prime UTR of IGF-1R, because there was no, no known cis regulatory element there, and put it into uh, RNA fold, right? And she noticed that the area where the mutation was had a very, uh, not that strong uh, stem loop as shown here. But what she noticed is that when she introduced the mutant, that actually stabilized the stem loop. And so what she did was she took the constructs of a mutated version and non-mutated version, did a luciferase assay, and you can see, indeed, there was actually more translation as a result of that mutation. But then what if you go ahead and perturb that structure? And so that's what she did next. She went ahead and put a stabilizing mutation on the other side, which would create this, was similar to this, but different from that. And she saw that was actually translated at high levels too. But really interestingly, when she destroyed the, sec the secondary structure through uh, adding three nucleotides right around here, that actually completely decreases or prevents this increase in translation. Demonstrating that sequence-based elements and structure-based elements could be important for titrating gene expression through the three prime UTR at the level of translation. And lastly, she looked at the patient data because we had patient data on these rapid autopsy patients. This is a lot of capillomyosis, but I'll have you pay attention to the one at the upper left. She noticed that patients with 
oncogenic 3' UTR mutations were more likely to develop androgen independence, which is bad for prostate cancer patients, compared to those that don't. So the takeaway for the first part of this talk is dual complementary massively parallel reporter assays reveal that about 5% of mutations found in patients can impact mRNA translation or mRNA stability. A knock and experiments revealed that patient-based single point mutations can titrate protein levels leading to uh, cellular phenotypes under stress and functional three prime UTR mutations are associated with faster androgen dependence, bone metastasis and lower overall survival rates. Now, that's the first part of my talk. That's the function of genomics. But what I'd like to do is now kind of move over from the RNA side of MRI translation and transition over to some of the protein elements that create, that, uh, that create the proteins that we love to eat, that we love to exist in, okay? And this one in particular uh, is a story that was spearheaded by Sujanta John in my lab who is, has been a, just a wonderful postdoc in my lab for the past six years. She too is on the job market and actually just got a job. Uh, so she'll be finishing up at the end of this year. She really spearheaded this project her whole time here and really thought deeply about this particular problem. Cindy Waladeka is my lab manager. She's wonderful, been with us since 2019 and she helped push this project through the publication. So when we think about the cancer, and mRNA translation. Usually we think about, and in particular tumor suppressors, we think of tumor suppressors as negative regulators of translation. In other words, it's there to put the brakes on translation so the cell can't translate as much and therefore not grow as well. But if you go ahead and remove that tumor suppressor, translation increases. And as a result of that, that's able to drive oncogenic processes. And this has been shown by multiple groups uh, shown here with P53, P10, APC, PDCD4. And we and others have also shown that increased protein synthesis is actually really important for tumor initiation and progression in cancer. And so when I started my lab back in 2014, uh, I'm a genital urinary oncologist, which means I see patients with bladder and prostate cancer. And bladder cancer was something new that I was getting to. It wasn't something I did in a postdoc, but I had seen some of these patients in the clinic. And I knew that there was nothing in the literature on mRNA translation in bladder cancer. So I thought that might be a, new, a good place for me to start something new in my own laboratory. Fortunately, that was also the year that TCGA came out for bladder cancer. And so I was able to look at, at a list of genes that were commonly mutated in patients with bladder cancer. And when we looked, it turns out one of the most commonly regulated genes was this gene called ARID1A, uh, which is actually a chromatin remodel remodeler, part of this thing called the Swysniff complex or the BAF complex. Uh, there are a lot of people over at uh, the Hutch that study this, including Steve Hennikoff and uh, Toshi uh, Sukiyama. And so we got interested in studying this because this was mutated in about 26% of bladder cancer patients. Um, and what does it do? Well, it actually harnesses the power of ATP to move nucleosomes on DNA around and influence the exposure or the covering up of promoters and enhancers. And so as a result of that, it's able to lead to control of transcription. And others have shown at the time the ARID1A was considered tumor suppressive because most of the mutations were loss of function mutations and genetic deletion leads to transcription of oncogenic networks, impaired double-stranded rake repair, decantation, and ultimately tumor formation in certain models. But people were not looking at it yet in bladder cancer. There was some cell line work, nothing in vivo. And so we decided to look at it in this organ. That's the bladder. Just a little bit of orientation. So bladder basically is a bag that holds urine. Um, and the idea here is it's trying to keep everything out and just the urine in. And when you or an animal decides they're going to, you know, evacuate that, it, it evacuates. So it's a very simple layer. There's this very simple urothelial layer here that basically protects the inside of the body from the inside of where the urine's kept. And this particular layer is the layer that causes cancer. Because right underneath that is muscle, that never turns into cancer. Behind that is adventition, that doesn't turn into cancer. It's those cells right there. It's the urothelium. The next thing we want to do was say, okay, TCGA tells us that these are loss of function mutations, but do we actually see a lack of protein in patients, ARID1A protein in patients 
with bladder cancer. And so we went ahead and teamed up with Ming Lam uh, from the GU uh, um, uh, rapid autopsy program uh, here at UW. And we used one of her tissue microarrays. And what we found is about 20% of patients actually expressed no um, arid one a So given this, we got the courage to basically create a mouse model uh, or use a mouse model that had already been created. And that was this one right here. So this is a UBC Cree ERT2 mouse model where UBC is ubiquitin in Cree, so it's expressed almost in every single cell. It's connected to a Cree ERT, that's the promoter. It's connected to a Cree ERT2, which means it's tamoxifen inducible. And then we crossed it with ARID1A, flux to flux around exon eight, I believe this was exon eight. So it's loss of function. And then uh, we also had a, a, a Rosaloxal flux YFP. And what you notice is when we add the tamoxifen, the urethelium, which typically has a lot of ARID1A, has pretty much no ARID1A left. And when we did that, the first thing we wanted to do was ask, okay, everyone says that this is a tumor suppressor. So when we get rid of it, it transcriptionally, we see a lot of tumor suppressor, a lot of oncogenic genes go up at the transcript level. So we went ahead and did RNA-seq, and that's exactly what we saw. Um, when we threw the top 262 genes, this is the GSCA that came out. It was mainly cell cycle regulators. And what was really interesting is that if you look at the genes one by one, many of these were... Oh, associated with cancer, including things like ODC1, aurora kinase B, ETV1, FGFR3, PPAR gamma, and IGF2. Some of these have even been shown in mouse models to be sufficient to cause cancers in different tissues. And so given this particular data, it gave us the courage to basically ask, okay, if we now age out these mice, for sure we're gonna see some type of phenotype. So let's go ahead and age out these mice. And let's go all in, let's age them out for 400 days. So we did that. And this was probably one of the darker days in the lab. We didn't see anything. There's no tumors, zero tumors. And not only that, we didn't even see thickening of this urethelium, which is right here. And in fact, if you look at the quantification, there was pretty much no difference between uh, wild type and arid one a In fact, the arid one a may be a little bit less, okay? So this finding to us was interesting in the sense that it would suggest that the transcriptional push was not sufficient to drive cancer phenotypes within the bladder. And so then the big question is why? And so we posited that maybe there was a, another process that was happening after the mRNA gets made that was not being engaged such that the end product is not more proteins of oncogenic genes. And so in order to study that in a very simple manner, we went ahead and did this thing called a pyromycin incorporation assay. And what that is, is it uses pyromycin, which we commonly use to select cells. Well, what does it do? It actually binds, it, it looks like a tRNA. It binds to the nascent chain. And when it does that, that becomes an epitope for antibodies that recognize pyromycin label proteins. And so basically you get a readout for protein synthesis within the mouse bladder just by doing immunofluorescence. And so when we did that, we noticed something very um, striking, which is when you lose ARID1A, you see a significant decrease in protein synthesis. And so I did tell you, though, this is a whole body knockout, UBC Cre ERT2. It could be that this is something non cell autonomous, something outside is making those cells like not translate as well. So we want to answer this question definitively. So we did a few things. One is create another mouse model using a K5 Cree ERT2. So this is specific to the basal cells or the lower lining of the, of the um, urinary bladder. And when we knocked out ARID1A there, what you'll notice is that these are the basal cells. These are the ones in green. And what you'll notice is that when we knock out ARID1A, you specifically don't see it in the basal cells. And that's also specifically where you see a dramatic decrease in protein synthesis. Now, this was pretty significant proof for us that this seemed to be like a cell autonomous, uh, cell autonomous process. But just to be extra sure, we went ahead and developed organoids from these, and we did an S35 methionine incorporation assay as well as a pyromycin incorporation assay. And we see in both cases a decrease in protein synthesis ability of cells without ARID1A. And lastly, we added back ARID1A within the organoids, and that completely restores protein synthesis demonstrating that ARID1A, okay, it's called a tumor suppressor, 
but it doesn't suppress protein synthesis. It actually buttresses it. It holds it up, right? And so at this point, we're like, okay, maybe what we're seeing is a clash between transcription upregulation of oncogenic uh, mRNAs and then translation not doing its job. And as a result of that, this clash makes it such that nobody wins in terms of the oncogenes, right? And so in order to kind of parse out what aspect of translation was being affected, what we did was we did an old school assay. This is, again, the polysome uh, uh, fractionation. And so polysomes, again, this is kind of a schema of what it looks like. It allows us to basically separate out uh, RNAs that have a lot of ribosomes on them versus RNAs that don't. And what's really interesting is that usually when you see less protein synthesis, you would expect there to be, I'm going to ask everyone a question, more or less polysomes. Would you expect more polysomes or less polysomes if there's less translation? Less, right? We would expect less because there's less translation going. On. And so what that would look like would be the, those little bumps would be lower. But you'll notice here with ARID1A, it was like the complete opposite. In fact, there seemed to be more of these polysomes. So sometimes when you research one thing for a long time, you just, you think everything's that. And so for me, I kind of ground my teeth in the translation field, studying translation initiation. And in that particular case, it's the starting of translation, that would be true. If you have less initiation, you should have less ribosomes and therefore it should go down. But what I failed to look at was looking at translation elongation. So once the ribosome has gone out of the gate past the ATG, there's a speed by which it's translating. And if it slows down, you're going to get more ribosomes, right? If you're initiating a specific rate, but slowing down, you're just going to get more and more ribosomes there. And if that happens, you would see an uptick of the polysomes, which is what we see here. Now, this is just a correlation. We want to measure the speed of the ribosome in the context of ARID1A loss. So we went back to literature and there was an old S35 assay that was discovered or created in the 1977 um, called the ribosome half transit time. And that helps you measure the speed of the ribosome when you perturb a gene within cells. And so when we looked at that, this is what we found. We found that the ribosome was moving half as fast when you actually lose ARID1A than in compared to wild type cells. And so given this particular finding, this guy's thinking, wait, wait, okay, transcripts are up, but elongation is down. Maybe those 262 genes are not being translated well. We want evidence for this. So we went back, collected the RNAs and the polysomes, did RNA-seq and looked at those 262 genes. And you notice that 70% of them were actually stalled. They had increased P2S ratio, okay? As a result of losing ARID1A. And just to be extra sure, we did mass spectrometry, and we noticed, again, 70% of those genes that were upregulated transcript levels were not different at all in the context of ARID1A loss. And so what we call this process is transcriptional translational conflict. So the conflict of these two basically cancel each other out. And I'm going to show you some evidence that this is very likely tumor suppressive. But first, the mechanism. How is translation elongation at all tied to chromatin remodeling of air, uh, led by ARID1A? One question we got asked a lot was, well, hey, you're messing with ARID1A, that binds to a lot of areas of chromatin, maybe you're just making less RNA altogether. And so what we did, we did RNA-seq with an ERCC spike in where we were able to quantify exactly how much RNA was in the wild type in the ARID1A setting. And we saw no difference in total mRNA comparing wild type to ARID1A. So then we did a can gene analysis of regulars of translation. And what we noticed was that there was no difference in pole one and pole three, right? So these are uh, obviously things that make RNA and tRNA. We noticed no difference in the PI3K AKTM tor signaling pathways, which is commonly deregulated in cancer and a regulator of translation initiation. We looked at the integrated stress response, which is known to, under stress to shut down translation, no difference. We looked at translation initiation factors, that which I love studying as a postdoc, no difference. But then we went to elongation. That's where we found this finding right here, which there's an increased EF2 phosphorylation in the context of ARID1A loss.
So EF2, uh, this is an organoid. So we wanted to make sure the same thing was happening in the tissues. And indeed, in tissues without ARG1A, we see a significant increase in EF2 phosphorylation. So why is EF2 phosphorylation important? Well, EF2 is actually a uh, protein that helps ribosomes translocate. And so when you actually phosphorylate it, that actually prevents EF2 from functioning and it leads to less translocation of the ribosome. And so this actually does go along with our observation of slower transit times because we see increased phosphorylation. So of course, the big question, what phosphorylates EF2? And it's, it's great that, you know, it's great to read the literature. Uh, it turns out that there was another group that had done a lot of work on what e, uh, phosphorylates EF2, and there's pretty much only one kinase called EF2K, right? And so EF2K, uh, when it's not phosphorylated, it is active. However, when it's phosphorylated here at three, CRNE366, it's inactive. So we decided to look in our tissue samples from the mice at total levels of EF2K as well as the inactivated form. And what we noticed was that total EF2K levels were actually somewhat increased as a result of loss of ARID1A. And the inactivated form was significantly decreased. Again, it showing that there seemed to be a net increase in EF2K activity, okay? So then, you know, we're kind of working out the chain here, maybe getting closer to the truth of what's actually regulating this. But first, before there, we want to know whether or not that EF2K was responsible for the translational phenotype we see in ARID1A deficient cells, uh, cells and mice. But this was completely a mouse experiment. So we went ahead and did a pharmacogenomic approach. Basically what that means is we either knocked out EF2K using a new mouse model called the ARID1A EF2K knockout mouse, versus using a small molecule inhibitor of EF2K called A484954. And when we did that, first looking at the genomic study, we found that when we knock out EF2K, get rid of completely, so EF2 cannot be phosphorylated, that completely gets rid of EF2 phosphorylation as shown here and completely restores translation. So it is indeed the phosphorylation of EF2 that is responsible for this phenotype. And just to make sure it's the catalytic activity of EF2K responsible for this, we went ahead and used that small molecule, and we see the same phenotype, where you see a significant decrease in EF2 phosphorylation and restoration of protein synthesis. So now, going up the ladder, what regulates EF2K uh, and its phosphorylation? And so that gets even more complicated. And this was work done by Christopher Proud. He very painstakingly worked out all these pathways in regulating the phosphorylation of EF2. Turns out there's an activating phosphorylation and an inhibitory phosphorylation. We didn't see any differences in AMPK, so we didn't go down that route. We looked at PI3K already and we saw no difference. But when we looked at MAP kinase signaling pathway within the mouse, what we noticed was that when you lose ARID1A, you get a significant decrease in the phosphorylation state of these MAP kinase um, proteins. But there's no difference in total protein level. There's no difference in mRNA level, suggesting that it's somehow there's less signaling through MAP kinase. But the question is how? And so MAP kinase, we all know it. It's actually regulated by RAS, right? And so we did a very simple study. We would say, okay, we have all this RNA-seq data. Let's look at the RNA-seq data between cells that have ARID1A and those that don't. Let's look at all RAS regulators. And so we looked at all the RASs. We looked at um, the, uh, uh, the RAFs as well. And we didn't see any change between wild type and mutant. However, when we looked at the guanine exchange factor, that's important for the activity of RAS, we noticed that RAS grip one was significantly downregulated at the transcript level as a result of loss of ARID1A. And so this was a clue that maybe RAS grip one levels, which can control MAP kinase activity, was the cause of this particular phenotype. And so we went back to the mouse and we saw that indeed RAS grip one levels were down at the protein level when you lose ARID1A. So it wasn't just a transcript phenomenon, we actually saw it in tissue in vivo. And so, you know, when rest, so when ARID1A moves nucleosomes around, one of its other activities is to prevent other transacting factors from binding DNA. And one of the ones that it seems to be in a yin and yang relationship with is this uh, complex called the PRC2 complex. 
The PRC2 complex methylates DNA at promoters. Uh, it, it deposits this H3K27 trimethylation that actually inhibits promoter activity. So basically inhibits the way that, that uh, inhibits the ability of something to be transcribed. And so our idea here was that maybe we were losing ARID1A and as a result, SWISNF couldn't bind to RASCRB1 promoter. And as a result, PRC2 complex could be there to then inhibit its transcription. And so we teamed up with um, Steve Hennikoff, who created cut and run and cut and tag. And we did H3K27 trimethylation cut and tag on our cells. And we saw that when you lose ARID1A, and that's in the red, you get a significant increase in this inhibitory mark. Right? And this inhibitory mark caused by PRC2, the enzyme that does it is called EZH2. So PRC2, big complex, EZH2 is the catalytic unit. Okay, And so we go, okay, if that's caused by EZH2, then if we use the small molecule against EZH2, we should be able to influence RAS grip transcript levels and protein levels. And so we did this experiment where we took our cells and added on GSK126, which is an inhibitor of rest of, of ECH2. And we saw when we did that, it completely restores or increases RASCRIP1 levels. And we see this at the transcript level, we see it at the protein level. This would suggest that ARID1A is actually controlling nucleosomes right around RASCRIP1 that enable it to not be attacked by PRC2. But when it's gone, it's it's fair game and PRC2 comes, inhibits it. And that's why we see RASCRP1 levels go down. Now, the big question though is, is RASCRP1 responsible for EEF2 phosphorylation? And so to answer that question, we teamed up with the Yerman Roos at UCSF who had a mouse model. We had knocked out RASCRP1. And when we looked at that, you'll notice just looking at EEF2, uh, looking at RASCRP1, in the RASCRP1 knockout um, bladders, there's no more RASCRP1. And you see complete restoration of EEF2 phosphorylation. This is a long way of basically saying that the mechanism by which ARID1A regulates translation speed is through the MAP kinase signaling pathway, in particular, the transcription regulation of RASCRIP1. So that's the mechanism. But the big question is, so what? So what that we see this block? It's a block that's literally silent, right? Nothing happens to the cancer. No, no, sorry, nothing happens to normal tissue. And so we wanted to ask, okay, if we have this conflict, what if we go ahead and turn the conflict around, right? What if we go ahead and just de-repress the translation part, rescue translation, what happens to the cell? Now, this is where things got interesting. We noticed, and this is where I just strongly believe there's no such thing as a negative piece of data, because for years, when we were working with these ARID1A cells, what we noticed is that if you passage these organoids over time, you actually start losing ARID1A negative cells. And in fact, this is what the Western blot looks like after nine passages. Well, that would suggest that there's replicative, there's not replicative immortality in these cells. They eventually, they lose out in some way, shape or form. But what's really interesting is when you cross this ARID1A mouse with an EF2K mouse, make organoids and then do the same experiment and look for ARID1A levels, you'll notice that we never lose any ARID1A levels. Uh, sorry, we never gained back ARID1A levels as a result of de-repressing translation elongation. In fact, when we did clonogenicity studies, we saw that the cells were more clonogenic. They actually proliferated somewhat faster. So given these findings, we got enough, um, or actually I say Sujata got enough bravery actually to do the, another 400-day study, and this time in the context of the double knockouts. And when we did that, what she found was that there was uncontrolled cell growth within the urothelium. Now, this is not cancer. I'm this pathology crowd, so you can ask me this. This is not cancer, but it certainly is a lot of hyperplasia, and this is the quantification for that. And that is one of the features of cancer, uncontrolled cell growth, but it's not full transformation. So in order to get at the transformation question, we went and had and turned to um, a carcinogenesis model. Now, the carcinogen we used here is called BBN, it's a nitrosamine, which is commonly found in cigarette smoke. Cigarettes, by the way, are the leading cause of bladder cancer. So it's another reason why we shouldn't smoke. And so when you give this BBN in the drinking water to the mice, it actually does not collect anywhere in the body except in the urine. And so because it's sitting there against the, ur the urethelium, 
slowly but surely they will transform. And by six months, all of them develop bladder cancers. And so we did a very simple experiment. We took wild type mice, arid 1A and the double knockouts, and then we first got rid of arid 1A. Then we gave them BBN and we measured tumor size and as well as tumor protein level, uh, arid 1A protein levels. And this got really interesting in that the arid 1A knockouts were very, uh, didn't grow very well. And in fact, the tumors were actually smaller. And so, you know, this was very confusing to us for a while until we actually stained for arid 1A within the tumor tissue. And that's what we noticed is that instead of having arid negative, arid 1A negative tumors, we had arid 1A positive tumors, suggesting that in this experiment, the, one, the cells that actually went out are the wild type cells, and those are the ones that actually transform. However, in the double knockout, where you already unleashed translation, in that context, we see larger tumors, and every single tumor that forms is actually arid 1A negative. And lastly, now this is a very specific perturbation, right? We're actually de-repressing translation elongation rates, but what about just increasing translation by itself? Could we then unleash the oncogenic properties of arid 1A loss? Well, it turns out using this BBN model, we showed some time ago that normal uh, bladder has about this much protein synthesis, but when you create tumors within those same mice, the, the protein synthesis literally goes off the charts. And so we asked very simply, if you go ahead and take arid 1A mice, first give them tumors to basically get rid of the translation problem first, and then have them lose arid 1A, what happens in terms of survival, proliferation, as well as those conflicted genes? And so this um, was the Kaplan-Meier for that. And what you'll notice is that if you cause a tumor first, then lose arid 1A, the mice do poorly. And that's because the tumors grow faster. And we know that because you see increased KI67. And those previously conflicted genes that were conflicted with wild type cells losing arid 1A are no longer conflicted and are translated at high levels. So I got one more slide of data, uh, which is can we therapeutically induce transcriptional translational conflict? So I tell you that we have this, basically this war between transcription and translation we can actually cause cancer phenotypes if we just turn up translation. But what if we can use drugs to turn it back? Is that therapeutic? And so we went ahead and searched literature, and it turns out there's one FDA approved translation inhibitor called homoherotonin, also known as uh, omotaxine methosuccinate. It's given to patients with treatment refractory CML. And so we went ahead and used this on organoids derived from cancers that were arid 1A negative versus wild type. And what we notice is that at concentrations which didn't affect wild type cells as much, the arid 1A ones were much more sensitive. Now this is mouse, so we went ahead and went to human looking for low arid 1A, and indeed the low arid 1A ones were much more sensitive to the inhibitor capacity of homoherotonin. And lastly, what we did was we went to uh, PDX models, patient-derived xenografts. We took a look at a whole bunch of them and measured arid 1A levels. And we found ones that had no arid 1A, some arid 1A, and a lot of arid 1A. And what we noticed is that the ones with no arid 1A were very sensitive to HHT, as shown here. But what you'll notice is that as arid 1A levels increase, sensitivity decreases, in that the middle ones were somewhere in between. And the ones with high arid 1A were completely insensitive to the inhibitory effects of homoherotonin. So today, what I've shown you is that we've discovered a new tumor suppressed process that we call transcriptional translational conflict. And that if you go ahead and turn up translation in that context, you can actually drive cancer phenotypes. And in the context of carcinogenesis, you can actually drive cancers all the way. This turns out it might be a therapeutic liability of arid 1A deficient tumors because when we use homoherotonin, that causes uh, cell deaths. And in the kind of the bigger context of cancer uh, genes and how they cause stress in cells, it turns out, as we all know, that a lot of cancer genes, when we think about them, we think, ah, P53, really bad, you know, P10, uh, really bad, MYC, really bad, right? Uh, sorry, not P53, but P3CA. But it turns out the first thing that these things do, do in normal cells is actually cause some kind of stress, and the, and the cell has to respond. For instance, if you overexpress MYC and fibroblasts, this is a classical experiment that was done, 
uh, many years ago. It actually causes apoptosis. P10, when you lose it within the mouse prostate, can cause senescence. And then P3CA in the skin can actually cause differentiation of basal cells such that they don't form cancers. Well, what we posit is that ARID1A loss leads to EF, EF2K, sorry, EF2 mediated transcriptional translational conflict, which is tumor suppressor, which has to be overcome for cancers to take off within the bladder. Um, I'm very excited about this project because we've recently teamed up with Petros Grivas, who is a clinical investigator, a professor here at UW, who is now we're working with a drug company. We're going to start a phase two clinical trial of a small molecule inhibitor against translation in bladder cancer patients who have ARID1A mutations. So more to come on that, probably read out in a few years. I also want to kind of highlight the fact that I live in a really cool ecosystem, not just in the Pacific Northwest, but of other bladder cancer researchers in the clinical science, translational science, patient center outcome sciences, basic mechanistic pathology, uh, as well as main trainees. We do meet every Thursday of the month since 2015. If you guys are interested, please let me know. Happy to have you guys join us. So this work cannot, could not have been done without the patients and families uh, because we did a lot of patient tissue work. Uh, so we're very indebted to their work. This work was primarily done by Samantha Schuster, graduate student, now on the job market, as well as uh, Sujata Jana, postdoc, also on the job market. Uh, they did a wonderful job and very indebted to them. Um, again, we work in a really great ecosystem and a lot of people to talk to about our work. Want to point out Ming Lam, who provided a lot of the tissue specimens, uh, Patrick Passon for helping us get into functional genomics when we were noobs in that field completely. Uh, also want to thank the Hennekoff lab as well as the Roof lab for providing expertise on cut and tag as well as the uh, RASGRP1 knockout mice. These are my funding sources. Thank you guys very much. Have to take any questions. And I'm supposed to show you this slide right now, so. So that was a super cool talk. Um, so what one of the sl data slides that you showed was kind of interesting to me, which is this, you know, you're saying that if you passage the ARID1A knockouts, yeah. they kind of, peter out and the wild type kind of take over. Mm. And that's kind of the direct opposite of what we see in, in normal tissue in, in, in human tissue, yeah, like right. as, in, in particular bladder urothelium, yeah. uh, where you get clonal expansions mm -hmm. of, of ARID1A. It's not yeah. uncommon. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of conflicts with mm -hmm. your cell mm -hmm. culture. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, so I would say, you know, there certainly is clonal outgrowth of ARID1A mutants within the bladder in normal tissue. That's been shown. Um, I would say a few things. One, the speculation is that the normal tissue also has all the cells underneath it, which do interact and regulate growth. So that's one. Number two, though, because we were like this made the project very difficult because every few weeks she had to sort out the cells. She had to make new lines and things like that. Um, but what we noticed was Calvin Quo, who does organoids within the, um, in the stomach, he actually came out with a cancer discovery paper a few years before ours that basically showed that he also could not create these organoids by themselves from humans. His was from humans. But it was only in the context of P53 loss that they can actually create these things that actually had clonal expansion. So I think there's something different in that organoid culture system than what we see in humans. And it's, it's, it's a very important question. That was a very great talk, Andrew. Um, so, um, so ARI1A in some cancers uh, functions as uh, oncogene, a tumor suppressor. So just wondering your thoughts on, um, in the context of transcriptional, translational conflicts, right. mm -hmm. in that context where ARI1A is an oncogene instead of a tumor suppressor. Right, right. so uh, the question basically is ARID1A um, uh, has been shown to be an oncogene in certain situations. And I think probably the best work for that was maybe, I think it was Hao Zhu's lab. It's shown in the liver um, that ARID1A dosages can have paradoxical effects. Um, and my answer to that is basically, 
we did look at other normal tissues to see which ones actually have changes in protein synthesis. So what I can tell you is when we lose ARID1A in a normal bladder epithelial cell, protein synthesis also goes down. We also looked at the murine stromal cells within the bone marrow, protein synthesis also goes down. Turns out two years before we published our paper, another lab at Stanford, where Jill Crabtree was, we were pretty nervous about this paper, showed that if you use, um, I think it was MEFs or some kind of normal immortalized cell line, ARID1A loss seems to make protein synthesis go down. So I do think that there seems to be quite a few tissues that are affected that way. That said, I can say that ARID1A causing cancers in different tissues is definitely, it's not all or none. It's definitely tissue specific, you know? So I think that there is a tissue specificity to these sites that ARID1A actually binds to within liver chromatin versus prostate chromatin versus bladder chromatin that probably dictate their dependence on the levels of ARID1A. You know, and that's, that's speculation here. Most of the ones that I've seen so far are, do show it as a tumor suppressor, but not all of them. Liver is one of them where it's clear it's the dosing matters a lot. And I don't know. I don't know if we then, I know when we took an ARID1A deficient setting and added back ARID1A, it increased protein synthesis. But if we took an ARID1A normal setting and increased it, I'm not actually sure what would happen there in terms of protein synthesis. Andrew, great, lovely presentation. I have a question about the the model in the in the bladder. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah. Nice. So, yeah, zooming in. Um, so I, I loved your talk. A lot of material um, there that uh, I'm going to have a time digesting. But um, the tumor in the bladders does that ever behave like a cancer, metastasizing, invading other organs? That's a great question. So, you know, every model has is just a model. And yeah. we noticed that with, we, we actually, I have not yet done an experiment where I just let the tumor keep growing. Yeah. So usually we take it down at a certain time, you know. Now, when we did it for that Kaplan Meyer that you saw there, mm -hmm. we had to take it down because these mice were actually losing weight. And yeah. I think they were losing weight. When we cut them open, you actually see they have hydronephrosis. So I mm -hmm. think what's happening there is they're cutting off basically their ability to urinate. And so I don't think in these models, we're going to be able to get a metastasis model easily because the first thing that kills them is basically renal failure. Yeah. Um, however, we did see some very large tumors. And, and once in a while, we will actually see an upper tract tumor. And we didn't mm -hmm. look very carefully at the lungs and the liver to see whether or not there's any cancer there. But actually, I think we actually did keep the carcasses. So we could actually look. Okay, interesting. And then I wonder if you, if you add to the gene mix other genes known to at least associated with tumor progression and metastasis, if that could then lead to metastatic tumor so I there's been, yeah there's actually been a number of studies with this arid1a mouse this knockout mouse yeah. where people have basically um engineered it with different mutations so a common one two mm -hmm. common ones were p10 and pic 3 ca which mm -hmm. i was very interested in because those all drive protein synthesis we and others have shown that and it turns out when you put those two together within the ovary um, that actually causes a type of ovarian cancer within the mouse. Um, in terms of metastasis, we haven't seen it with bladder in terms of our models, but I honestly think it's because the model dies for other reasons and not because it can't metastasize. Yeah, 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 thanks. That's good. I had uh, two questions, and it was a really nice talk. Um, I was trying to remember back to the clonal expansion in urothelium papers of a couple of years ago. Do you think ARID1A could have a promoting aspect to that early and an inhibitory aspect late, depending upon the co-occurrence of other oncogenic mutations in the tumors? I'm wondering if you've got something that you know could promote outgrowth, is not sufficient by itself to drive it, but uh, could either be inhibitory or uh, it might promote clonal competition with the accumulation of other mutations. 
For instance, are P53 co-occurring mutations common in the tumors, but not in the clonal expansions? Right. So, so, so in terms of clonal expansion, you're specifically saying that they're co-occurring within the same cell, not a cell that's next to it, right? Like within yeah. the same cell. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I would say that, you know, co-occurring mutations in area of 1A have been studied. We have not looked very closely at it, but I do know that P53 mutations are present in 50% of patients with bladder cancer. So it's the most common. In fact, when I looked at TCGA and I saw the top gene, I knew I wasn't going to study it because it was P53. And I was like, a lot of people study this. I'm going to study something that most people don't study. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if P53 is a co-occurrence there. And actually, that would be another answer for why it's possible. If there's co-occurrence, that certainly could tip the balance over, you know. Um, the other experiments that I point to are just the ones where they mix, you know, they, uh, they lose ARID 1A and lose a pro-proliferation -prolifer -pro or pro-protein synthesis gene. Sorry, turn on those processes. Those do seem to enable actually transformation. You know, so I wouldn't be surprised if co-occurrence co was not a, you know, co-occurrence was a thing that enabled clonal outgrowth. But I, I, was, I obviously know those, those beautiful papers that were published in Science for Bladder. I'm not sure if they, be, to me, those bladder papers all, they talked a lot about basically plaques of specific genes, right? arid one a right here, KDM2D here, and all that kind of stuff. But they don't talk as much about co-occurrence. I couldn't couldn't remember the details either. That's why I had to ask them. The other question I had goes back to the very beginning of your talk, where you're talking about uh, three prime UTR mutations and the fact that they seem to be spatially clustered. Yeah. Do you find those in population data outside the context of cancer? Mm -hmm. Are these mutational hotspots, or is there a mutational mechanism right. that might be giving rise to those where they're harvested? and used in the, in a tumorigenic context. So we, so we actually did a hotspot analysis using fish hook on our entire data. So we had a small data set. I mean, it was almost 200 patients, but that's small. And we found two mutations at the top of that um, uh, oncoplot that seemed to have, to seem to be a hotspot. There was like a region where it was just consistently mutated from different patients. Um, but in general though, and the reason why I didn't call it hotspot was because the mutations that we see, while the same genes can be mutated in multiple patients, the same place is not very common, you know? And so I'm not, I actually took it out of, we, well, we were also asked to take the word out of the paper, you know, because it's, it's not hotspot by that definition. I agree with that, you know? I think what we've learned from this, so, so what have I learned from this experiment? I think one thing in particular is that somatic mutations can be used to define functionally important regions within RNA. That's something that we learned here. I also learned that somatic mutations are actually much rarer in this cancer than in, let's say, bladder cancer or melanoma. And if I could redo the whole thing and flip back time by six or seven years, I probably would have picked a higher mutational load type of cancer to actually answer this type of question. Um, but even with that said, when we have looked now at, um, at uh, some of the whole genome sequencing that's available through TCGA, it's still, there is still you know, very few regions where it's like, that's a, that's a, you know, a blazing hotspot region. You know? So I do think that while the data is interesting and it does point to a need to study UTRs better, we've since actually moved away from doing massive pellet reporter assays for the exact reasons that a lot of times when you actually knock in something, it doesn't do anything, even though the massively parallel reporter assay says it should. And so what we've done now is we've now moved over to a tile of CRISPR screens. So I'm really, really interested in what we can do there in terms of studying the topology of UTRs as they relate to important genes in cancer. I mean, the, the other question, uh, just to follow up on that, are you or other people looking at three prime variation is a risk factor, not only in the context of cancer, but potentially in other diseases by virtue of modulating gene expression. So I just got asked to review a paper, um, not on cancer, but on another type of disease. It was specifically looking at UTR mutations and this particular disease. So I do think that 
people are looking at this. I do think now that we're in the age of base editing, prime editing, there's no reason why we shouldn't be studying these in their endogenous context. But even that has a problem, right? If you take a cell, change it, it doesn't mean that that cell, which is proliferating and growing off of FBS, is going to be the same thing that's happening in your brain, stomach, or toe. I want to ask, I know there are trainees here. Any trainee questions? Have to answer them. Let me chat. Uh, A or one I do you want a um seems like a secondary hit like there should be another mutation that is flipped in the direction of um aiding translation so is that all the same in bladder cancer or is it like different mutations? So there are actually a lot of PIK3CA mutations within bladder cancer so we do see that the interesting thing is if you look at TCGA and that's a great question thanks for asking it like. There are a lot of mutations in chromatin modifiers, like EP300, KDM6A, we were talking about KMT2D. There's a lot of them, you know, um, that are modified there. But if you look further down, there are regulators of translation, like the one, the, the main one is the PIK3CA uh, family, you know. I think one thing we don't know as well, and but we are going to know, is that um, there's much more whole genome data coming out now. And I do wonder if there are structural alterations that change, like amplify MIC and things like that. I think these are big questions um, that need to be answered, you know, and other, you know, um, uh, variants because of um, uh, chromosome translocation and stuff like that. So I think there's more to be learned by that. We are seeing some regular translation go up, you know, in bladder cancer, and it would make sense. Thank you, Thank you guys very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming out.